Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the title of my presentation you'll see on the screen. I think this is a, a fascinating topic. I'm sure it's uh, um, something that I think after this very brief sort of 10 minute presentation you'll also find quite interesting as well. Um, you probably don't know this, but in 2016, every new residential property, new build, has to be what we call zero carbon, defined by the government within the UK. And in 2019, every new commercial building needs to be this thing called zero carbon. So you've probably got some thoughts in your mind already about how is that possible, what does that mean, is that realistic, is it fact or fiction? Um, so what does it mean to be zero carbon and what is by definition a zero carbon building and it's an interesting debate and an interesting topic which is receiving as you can imagine quite a lot of interest from housing developers, government officials and so on. When I think of a zero carbon building I'm thinking of something like this, I'm thinking of things which have no impact on the environment, um, things that are buildings that are created from local sources, buildings that don't use any heating, ventilation, cooling, power, and so on. To me, that's a true definition of what a zero carbon building is. So how are we gonna get from that to this? And how are the governments approaching this 2016, 2019 targets for residential and commercial properties? And it's a difficult question that has a difficult answer and what I'll try and do for the remaining time in the presentation is to give you a bit of a clearer understanding about what I think and what the government thinks. It all boils down to this really, when, we, when we're starting to think about this idea of something being zero carbon we need to consider a lot of different things but one of the main things is what is the life cycle of the building. So if we think about a building, we're thinking about all the resources that are needed, the extraction of materials, uh, steel, concrete, brick, so on. How those materials are manufactured, if they're manufactured in the UK or across Europe or overseas. How they're then brought to site and how construction happens on site. Um, what happens then when this building is built and it's maintained and occupied over a you know, 60, 70 year period, what happens then? Then the building is demolished or reused um, and then finally it ends up in a landfill or it's recycled and so on. So there's a lot of different stages to consider in the life cycle of the building. So when we're considering a zero carbon building in 2016, 2019, are all these factors brought in? What we can do is to look at certain aspects and we call this stage the operational stage if we're looking at the life cycle of a, of a building. So the operational stage is, um, as it says, the operation of the building over say 60, 70 years. So that would include things like heating, lighting, cooling, use, all of those things. Every other part of that life cycle we call the embodied stage. So that's all of the processing and getting materials to site and recycling them and all of those various bits. So if we look at a, a typical conventional building, say, you know, built in the 1920s, so a, a semi-detached property built in the 1920s, what we find is if we split this operational side and the embodied side and we consider the entire lifetime use of that premises, we know that about 80% of the, uh, the, the carbon content as such is from the operation of the building, so the heating, cooling and so on, the living, and about 20% as a percentage split is from everything else. And as we move, as technology advances and we start to look at new things and aiming towards a zero carbon development, and we start with a, a transition phase and we start to look at a low carbon development. So a low carbon building would have things like uh, better insulation, maybe some solar panels on the roof, just, just a more advanced building, so a more modern building type, then that allocation of 80-20 split moves to around 
And then finally, when we think about a zero carbon building, this is a building that has no requirements for energy use, no heating and ventilation, air conditioning, none of that required. It's purely uh, what we call a passive design. Um, then the shift moves to how are these materials created, how are these technologies created. It, sh it shifts towards this embodied side. So it's quite an important transition from where we are now to where we need to be. Um, I've worked on my time, I've spent 10 years in industry uh, trying to look at these problems and trying to look at what it means for something to be zero carbon. Is that even possible? And I've worked on projects such as Dongtan in China where we looked at the, one of the world's first, first zero carbon cities. So we looked at every aspect of the city. Can it be designed in a zero carbon way? What does it mean to be zero carbon, how can we look at transport, waste, materials, energy, all of those things and what does that mean? Other projects such as world's first zero carbon film studios um, worked on the development of planning of this project to compete with Hollywood in California. So this was a project planned uh, just south of Boston, a place called Plymouth, um, just by Cape Cod and that was a site to potentially produce the world's first zero carbon film studios. When working with, the, with, with these clients on these very interesting projects, you learn a lot from the experience. What does the client want out of the project? Uh, what, what can you deliver as part of that project? How do we define zero carbon? What does it mean? Um, and so on and so forth. Right the way through to projects across Europe I've worked on. Uh, a project in Finland where we looked at one of the first zero carbon districts. So we've taken it from a, a city level to a, a sort of master planning level right the way through to a local level. And what I've found is that this definition of something being zero carbon is, is, is very different depending on the mass and scale and project that you're in, involved with. And it's a very difficult concept. So how do we design this? How do we look at something and make it zero carbon. Um, it's a difficult thing to do, of course, but the first thing is to do nothing, and the best thing is to do nothing. If you're going to have something which is a zero carbon development, the best thing is not to build it in the first place, of course, but that's not living in the real world, and, and we have to build things and make things sustainable. So the first thing we do is to design a master plan, a community, a building, and we design it with what we call a fabric first approach. And when we're talking about building fabric, what we are discussing is how the building is built. What's the envelope of the building? Super insulation, um, airtight buildings, um, insulation in the, in the roof, on the floors, and cavity walls and solid walls. We, we design the fabric first to reduce the amount of energy we need to heat and cool the premises, which makes sense. So we take this fabric first approach and it's this fabric first approach that all developers now across the UK are starting to consider. The next thing we do is look at how we use energy within that master plan district or building. How do we use it? What do we do? How do we drive down demand? How do we maintain a steady temperature within each room? Why can't we turn the temperature down all the time? Well, simply because we get cold, so we need to keep the temperature up all the time. The optimum room temperature is about 21 degrees. So we need to maintain that temperature and look at how we use energy. The fourth thing we do in this sequence is to look at how we supply energy to the building. Do we just simply connect as we do to the grid? Do we pull on gas and electricity from the UK network? UK network is made up of coal, oil, gas, nuclear sources. So every time we switch a light on, we're using one of those four sources of energy. So how does energy get to us and how do we do that? And the last thing that we do when we've maximized through all of those stages is to do something called offsetting, something which is a bit of a misnomer really, but do we plant trees to offset, offset the carbon we can produce? Not, not a very good method or good technique, but it's the last resort technique. Do we invest in hydroelectric power plants in other parts of the world?
to offset what we produce and so on. So it's a, it's a bit of a contentious issue, but it's still an option if you really want to achieve this so-called zero carbon status. So we can work through this plan. And when we look at design, we're looking at what do we produce on an annual basis. So imagine we have a brand new building. The first thing we can do is measure how much, how much carbon we will, that building will produce due to its use, operation and so on over a 12 month cycle. And what we're trying to do with this is to get this down to effectively zero through better design. So we need to act on this bar chart straight away and get that amount down to as much as possibly can. That's the first thing we do. The next thing we do is to try and mitigate, offset, reduce by an equal amount. So if we can measure how much we produce and measure how much we can reduce, then we can get to an effectively zero carbon development. That's how it's seen, that's how the government see it, that's how property developers see it, is that we need to look at what we produce and what we can reduce and then effectively get, get to zero. When we look at the design features, when we design buildings, we're looking at the consequence of design. By producing a tall, slender building that has different energy requirements, by producing a, a deep pan or a shallow pan we call building on the type here, you can see there's different requirements, different design characteristics. The way we position a building on a master plan has a big difference. If we're going to fit maybe solar panels on the roof, we need to know which way the sun. The sun path, we need to look at south facing slopes to maximise sun use, stuff like that. So people who design big master plans, they're looking at designing um, to optimise design. The next thing, as I've mentioned, is energy use. So we look at the building when it's being designed or the master plan when it's being designed and we say how much heat is going to be lost through various parts of the building and we know about around you know these are the sort of percentages we can look at 25 percent through the roof 25 percent through windows and doors 15 percent through the floor 35 percent through the walls so that's why we have all these initiatives all these energy efficiency programs being run now within the uk which focus on loft insulation um, which focus on cavity wall and external wall insulation triple glazing for windows um, insulation of floors and so on this is obviously why it's happening so we look at energy use and we look at what we can do on on that scale it's the second thing we can do the last thing we can do is look at how we how we use energy how our energy is supplied and as i mentioned if we plug into the mains we use we're using coal oil gas nuclear and a small part of renewables um, but is it better to look at how we can use energy on site should we not connect to the network and try to create our own electricity on site. And that's where these advanced technologies start to come in, things like solar panels, um, wind turbines, ground source heat pumps, all these things, energy from waste plants, biomass plants, all of these things. Obviously, all this comes at a cost, and that's the crux of the matter and the, the problem, is that for a housing developer, say, to, to build a normal, say, three-bedroomed house, that could cost them £60,000, for argument's sake. What's the cost of doing all of this? Optimising design, optimising energy use, optimising supply? Well, the cost could double. But then the operational side of things will be dramatically reduced. So it's this consequence all the time between um, a capital expenditure and operational expenditure. So what's the government saying? We've got these targets for 2016 these targets for 2019, we all assume that the government said, well, a zero carbon building in that time covers all of these stages of the life cycle. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, we should be looking at the entire life cycle. Of course, that makes sense. But by 2016, will all buildings need to consider it? Well, yeah, they should. But the problem is they don't. And this is the government's definition of what it means by zero carbon development. So it's, it's as simple as that. A, s a home should be zero carbon for all energy use in the home. And what that basically means is that a development can qualify to be zero carbon just by looking at this stage, the operational stage, and that's it. So there's none of the other bits 
are considered in this zero carbon definition. Then we move on to politics. The coalition government has set this policy in place. They've said this. Previous governments have said we need to consider the entire life cycle. So as part of this scaling back of things, um, this is the problem. So it's just looking at this side, operational, which I think is a problem. We don't need to worry about the text on this and so on. So what the government is doing and what the government is saying is, for a house, for example, 2016, what a developer needs to do is concentrate on the fabric, maximise design, reduce the need for energy, first thing you do. The next thing we could do is look at technologies and what we call LZC, low and zero carbon technologies. So maximise design, then look at technologies, then look at solar panels, then look at all these different new technologies that we could do. If you're still not getting your energy down to effectively zero, then they're giving you this bit called allowable solutions, which is an offsetting program, which is a bit of a cop-out really. So it means that if you, even if you can't do all, maximise as much as you can, you can still use this offsetting bit on allowable solutions. You have to pay for that. So imagine we have a house, it creates, for argument's sake, a thousand tonnes of carbon per year. You then maximise the fabric, that comes down to 500 tonnes per year. You then look at technologies, you knock off another 200, you're left with 300 tonnes of carbon. The government's then put a price on carbon and you have to pay, say, £10 per tonne at 200 tonnes. And you have to pay that as part of an offsetting scheme. So it's a way to get to zero through, through paying a premium. So whether you think that's good or bad, that's, that's the position. Um, so in conclusion then, I think uh, zero carbons are a fact and I hope in this very short presentation you've seen where, where we are with this. Um, but they are only considered for this operational use bit and it should encompass the whole life cycle really. Politicians will continue to debate on this and whether or not we should go beyond this operational phase. And the final thing is, what about the existing stock of buildings we have? New builds account for only maybe 10, 12% of housing we have within the UK in the residential and commercial sectors. 85% um, of buildings we have will still be with us in 2030, 2040. So as part of this, this is just one snapshot for new buildings. What there is also is a whole programme of work around how we retrofit existing buildings. But the zero carbon definition does not apply to existing stock, just for new buildings. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.